Hello once again from David DeLima speaking to you from Adelaide here in South Australia. Our message today is entitled Serving God Within the Military. Serving God Within the Military. Today we will look at five areas. Firstly, civic authority and the rightful use of military force. And then secondly today, Biblical examples of soldiers providing justice and grace. And then thirdly today, esteem for military activity in the letters of Paul and beyond. And fourthly today, encouraging military personnel and their families. And our final area of concern today, participating in the regular reserve or cadet forces. Now, our opening quotable quotation comes from Martin Luther, who said famously, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. So we begin today with civic authority and the rightful use of military force. Now, many believers throughout history have rejected all military action, including policing, even self-defense, while other Christians have tried to curb immorality by somehow forcing the faith upon unbelievers. Now, both of those approaches hold a wrong concept of physical force. In contrast to that, a correct view recognises how Almighty God wants his message to be shared without the use of threat or violence, yet of course he requires the various civic authorities to ensure justice and community security, but without triumphal or smug self-sufficiency or unwarranted action. So rejecting self-reliant or self-assertive uses of force, the Psalms, it's Psalm 20 verse 7, states, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus similarly warned against wrongly motivated actions, saying, all who draw the sword will die by the sword. That's in Matthew chapter 26. So he rebuked James and John for <laughs> their request to burn a faithless town, as we read in Luke chapter 9. And he also said, put your sword away. That's in John chapter 18, as Peter began asserting his uh, faulty messianic agenda. Nor are spiritual victories obtained by force. As God's people do not wage war as the world does, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But those warnings, they do not negate the role of each civic authority who as God's servant does not bear the sword for nothing, we read in Romans chapter 13. So our Lord Jesus informed the Roman governor, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above, as recorded for us in John chapter 19. And he also declared, if you don't have a sword, Sell your cloak and buy one. That's in Luke chapter 22 and verse 36. Now, a, a humble and a right use of forceful intervention is approved according to Psalm 44 and verse 6. I do not trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. Moreover, David of old rejoiced in God who trains my hands for battle. That's according to 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 35. 
and affirming government and its God-given duty to curtail criminal activity, we may heed the biblical examples of soldiers who serve justly and graciously. So our second area today, the biblical examples of soldiers providing justice and grace. Almighty God has often used military action in order to secure justice and also to provide a ministry of grace. So, for example, well before God destroyed the city of Sodom in ancient times, Abraham's 318 armed men restored its king, we read, in whose presence this mysterious Melchizedek spoke of God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. We read that in Genesis chapter 14. And then to prefigure the gospel spreading to the Gentiles, as we read in Luke chapter 4, Elisha ministered to Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, this great man by whom the Lord had given victory. He was a valiant soldier, we read. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5. And after the exile, the people of God were instructed by Nehemiah. This is in chapter 4 and verse 14 of the book of Nehemiah. The people of God were instructed to fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Their resolve to take armed action enabled the restoration of the city and the temple of Jerusalem in which the Jewish people were to pray for the well-being of the king. That, of course, was pagan King Darius and his sons. That instruction is in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 10. Now, the New Testament also links justice, grace, and the action of the military. So, in the Judean desert, soldiers responded to John the Baptist by asking him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Those words are in Luke chapter 3. And then in Capernaum, Jesus helped a centurion who loved the Israelite nation and whose authoritative role provided a pattern of faith. Luke chapter 7. And then at Calvary, a centurion gave testimony after seeing the death of our Lord Jesus. Surely this man was the Son of God, he said, according to Mark chapter 15. And then at Caesarea, the centurion Cornelius, who served in the Italian regiment, he came to faith in Christ, in fact, as the first Gentile convert to Christianity. That's recorded for us in Acts chapter 10. And then in Jerusalem, Claudius Lysias, the commander of the Antonia Fortress, he took officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd to restore peace, saving the Apostle Paul, who was carried by the soldiers, we read. That's in Acts chapter 21. And in the barracks, a centurion's report, this man is a Roman citizen. This spared Paul from a brutal and illegal scourging. And we read that in Acts chapter 22. The troops then used force to free Paul from a violent session of the Sanhedrin, we read in Acts chapter 23. And finally, the commander kindly heeded the advice of Paul's nephew as he took the young man by the hand and dispatched a vast military force that escorted Paul safely to Caesarea. Again, it's the book of Acts uh, chapter 23. And then at Sidon, we read about the centurion Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. He was gracious to Paul. 
and he intervened to save the apostle's life. It's in Acts chapter 27. And thirdly today, esteem for military activity in the letters of the Apostle Paul and beyond. Although imprisoned by the military for many years, Paul, he so greatly valued their work that he frequently utilised martial terminology in his writings. That usage may deeply encourage God honouring activity among military personnel today. And so writing to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, the prisoner, he effectively upheld the work of the military as he urged the disciples to put on the full armour of God with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, and with feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel. He told them to take up the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation, and to brandish the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So that's for us written in Ephesians chapter 3 and chapter 6. And then responding to the Philippians while Paul was in change, he so loved his captors that the whole palace guard heard about Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul urged his readers to stand firm, contending as one man, that's Philippians chapter 1. And then in his communication with the Colossians, Paul urged them, see to, them that no, see to it that no one takes you captive. And commending Epaphras, who was always wrestling in prayer, the Apostle Paul exhorted the disciples, remember my chains. So that's in chapter 2 and chapter 4 of the book of Colossians. And then petitioning his good friend Philemon, as we read in that little book of Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, sends his greetings to Archippus, our fellow soldier, it says. Army personnel today would do well to fight the good fight of the faith, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and to endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, since no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer, as Paul wrote to Timothy in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 2. Soldiers would do well to put on the armour of light, according to Romans 13, along with faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet, as Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. They are to communicate clearly, because if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. N Naval and Coast Guard personnel may rejoice in the hope of the faith that is an anchor for the soul, according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 19. Seafarers may especially heed the example of Paul, who provided remarkable leadership to warn and to comfort and to guide his shipmates who, who are in distress, as recorded in Acts chapter 27, although Paul held no rank or position on that ship. Now, aircrew and airborne military may gladly rejoice as their nation-building or rescue efforts replicate aspects of God's own work. Flight excellence to secure the peace is akin to the authoritative benevolence of Almighty God who said, I carried you on eagles' wings in Exodus 19 and verse 4 and who takes firm action like an eagle that spreads its wings to catch its young, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. Turning now to encouraging military personnel and their families. Well, as the military may provide 
a civic outworking of God's declaration that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, according to Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 9, his people may particularly give their pastoral support to military personnel and to their long-suffering families. Such encouragement can and help to renew the work that's entrusted to the military. As the prophet Oded rebuked Israelite soldiers who slaughtered with a rage that reaches to heaven, according to Second Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9, we too may caution and uphold and advise the armed forces. This may reduce the brutalities that are sometimes inflicted by the military on itself or on the public or upon enemies who really should be tackled without injustice or and without gratuitous or unfettered engagement. This may involve pro-family policy also in the armed forces. The officer shall say to the army, has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, as Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verses 5 to 7 advises. And then if a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Wise words in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 5. And finally today, participating in the regular reserve or the cadet forces. Well, to help the military build up our nation and other countries, God's people may aspire to join and to lead the regular or the reservist or the cadet forces. Christian ideas of duty and service can help the regulars gain domestic or international security. And of course, godly concepts of volunteering these can enrich the reservists, each of whom is twice the citizen, as uh, Winston Churchill noted famously. And faithful concerns for youth can help the cadet units to engage in useful discipline and training and as a catchment for the military. Whether supporting or joining the military forces, we can encourage Christians in the services to witness bravely especially if persecuted, like those believers who served in Rome's 12th Legion, which was known as the Christian Legion. From its ranks came those famous 40 martyrs of Sebasta, the 40 martyrs of Sebasta, who died of exposure in AD 320. They proved their loyalty not only through military excellence, but in a spiritual battle that outweighs all earthly fights. Christians in the military today are called to witness like those martyrs and to supply security and peace until all people are ready to beat their swords into plowshares, according to Isaiah chapter 2, at the return and glorious reign of our Lord Jesus the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah chapter 9. Let us always remember, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I'm David DeLima. Cheerio.